thank you for the kind introduction uh, good morning all uh, it is a pleasure to be uh, presenting uh, in front of such esteemed audience uh, regarding an approach to an adult patient with breathlessness uh, coming to the outline of the presentation uh, i will be basically covering uh, regarding the chronic breathlessness syndrome and its causes assessment of breathlessness in a palliative care setting and how do we manage breathlessness in a palliative care before i proceed i must admit that in a present scenario of covid there is lot of confusion when the patient with breathlessness comes to us so i will not be touching upon it because it will be a different kind of scenario so i'll be considering concentrating only on breathlessness uh, in a patient in palliative setting in a non covid scenario because otherwise it becomes a lot of confusing talk so first uh, we should come to the point that what is dyspnea or breathlessness it is a term used to characterize a subjective experience of breathing discomfort that is comprised mainly of qualitative distinct sensations so it will vary from patient to patient so patients tend to have they say that they are breathing throughout their life but they now tend to feel their breath they are able to feel that they are breathing and it has lot of psychosocial physiological and environmental factors so it is a interplay of multiple factors and it causes lot of discomfort to the patient broadly we can have an acute dyspnea which develops over hours to days and or a chronic dyspnea which occurs for more than 4 to 8 weeks well this is an important symptom and there was a systematic review which uh, basically studied the symptoms which were present in advanced illness patients so there are common 11 symptoms which are there and breathlessness was one of the most common first three symptoms which were there especially in patients who were malignancy aids lung cancer heart disease and copd so it was a pretty common symptom and occurred in up to 90% patients in patients with lung cancer and heart disease or copd patients and more importantly regardless of the diagnosis the prevalence and severity of dyspnea tended to increase over last months of life so we can see this graph so this is a dis graph for dyspnea so as you grow go or towards the end of life would as we go closer to the death the symptoms tends to increase so this is a symptom which is mostly troublesome in patients who are dyspneic who are at the end of life they have limited time left and the disease primarily cannot be cured so the perception of dyspnea makes the patients very anxious the caregivers are also anxious and you need to do something to relieve that kind of perception broadly we can divide the causes of dyspnea into a primary a respiratory cause primary cardiac cause though this uh, classification is uh, more simplistic because many a times there there is an interplay of cardiac respiratory uh, causes and so but to for the academic purposes broadly we can say it it can be respiratory if there is a disorder of the central controller which includes the brain stem cortico volitional or a cortical behavioral there may be a disorder of the ventilatory pump muscle or the basically the mechanics of respiration which includes the muscles the rib cage the peripheral nerves the airway and the pleura or there may be a disorder in the gas exchange at the alveolar level or the pulmonary circulation any of these can lead to dyspnea which may be disproportionate to uh, to the patient's and may lead to perception in the patient there are common cardiac causes also like anemia say if it is less than 7 you start having symptoms but if it is severe anemia 3 or 4 gram per deciliter patients are very dyspneic they may not be able to day to day activities cardiac disease like acute ischemia systolic dysfunction or pericardial effusion can also lead to dyspnea and there is deconditioning in patients uh, they are basically weak they because of malignancy lot of deconditioning is there and so patients do feel dyspnea coming to the pathophysiology the sensation of respiratory effort basically arises from the motor cortex from there it goes to the sensory cortex and from sensory cortex the efferents go to the airway the the diaphragm the lungs the rib cage and they basically initiate and maintain the respiration in some patients there may be air hunger in combination of these stimuli which may increase the drive to breathe so basically if you have a decrease oxygen content in the body or co2 is increased then there are chemoreceptors which tend to take the sensations to the 
sensory cortex and lead to perception to breathe more strongly or there is acute hypercapnia or acidemia or if there is an inflammation or in the airway interstitium so somewhere in the lungs or in the upper airway the pulmonary afferents will will again take the signals and they go into the central cortex and there the, it is processed and you the the signal goes that you have to breathe more strongly and you have that perception so when there is a mismatch between the efferent messages to the muscles and the afferent signals to the chest wall and the lungs there there is an air hunger and perception of breathlessness so broadly we have, so there is a feedback system so there is a normal feedback system uh, because of the chemoreceptors or central or peripheral and mechanoreceptors which tend to maintain normal respiration when there is extra feedback on demand because of various pathophysiology the perception of breathlessness is there and there is an uh, effect of domain to it so the limbic system which has emotions and memory which comes into play and there is a central abstract thought so all these so thoughts about dying thoughts about uh, emotionally being uh, not well so they further add to the complexity and the dyspnea perception will further increase coming to the psychology of dyspnea so basically broadly uh, patients who are uh, terminal or towards the end of the disease it, whether malignant or non malignant they have an increased respiratory rate they tend to use more of accessory muscles and they may be dynamic hyperinflation of the lungs and the alveoli this all this leads to inefficient breathing and they if the breathing is inefficient means the work of breathing is more so the more of energy is spent on respiration itself which leads to breathlessness then patients do have anxiety distress the feeling of panic we have seen patients many a times especially if they don't know much about the disease and suddenly they realize they cannot be cured so they are very anxious so these thoughts basically leads to thought of dying them not have good their misconceptions about the disease then they are good they are not good or bad memories past experience all these things they lead they, they have a fear that they will die of breathlessness so this leads to the vicious cycle and they have more breathlessness similarly because of breathlessness the activity is reduced the tendency patients tend to, so this further leads to deconditioning and it leads to breathlessness so all these factors together lead to dyspnea so coming to the causes of dyspnea so causes can be primarily related to the cancer it may be a lung mass primary or metastatic it may be a pleural tumor maybe a svc syndrome or invasion of the tumor in the chest wall all this may lead to will affect the particular domain of the respiratory cycle the initiation of breathing and they add to the effect of dyspnea or there can be indirect effects like pneumonia cachexia anemia electrolyte abnormalities or pulmonary embolism or ascites patient do receive lot of therapy it may be surgery radiation pneumonitis chemotherapy that may lead to pulmonary fibrosis or cardiomyopathy all these things also lead to dyspnea in addition patients of malignancy or patients who are terminal otherwise like copd asthma ild these may be coexistent or they may be patients may be non malignant but since these diseases cannot be cured so we have they at the end of the disease tra trajectory they do have intractable dyspnea so patient with chf mi arrhythmias anxiety or uh, patients with aspiration all these patients may have dyspnea in some time towards the end of the disease cycle now coming to once now we know that dyspnea is common we have number of factors which lead to dyspnea now how do we assess dyspnea so the gold standard and most reliable method to assess dyspnea is a patient self reported system so most of the symptoms in palliative care are basically patient self reported and dyspnea is one of them so we have to ask the patient that how short they feel or rather, rather than estimating the degree of respiratory effort so patient might use respiratory muscles accessory muscles patient might be tachypneic but they are not enough to gauge the severity of dyspnea so you may have to ask leading questions like this is one of the uh, questions which might be there and you can ask the patient to take which is best suited to for their perception of dyspnea so my the questions like my breathing is shallow i feel an urge to breathe more there may be constriction in the chest or chest feeling tight uh, the breathing requires an effort feel out breath uh, i feel that i am breathing more so the the list is endless and beyond this if something else is there patient can write and it should if there are more than one then we should ask the patient which one of these best describes his dyspnea 
in addition we need to assess the limitation of physical activity so most of most of the patients who are dyspneic they are unable to do their activities of daily living and so they will be able to tell us that what are the activities they are at most able to do with minimal dyspnea we have a lot of monitors in hospitals like we can measure the pulse oximeter the saturation of the patient the arterial blood gas analysis the respiratory rate we can measure the ecg echo the list is endless but the, the all these monitors they do not add to the diagnosis they don't help in measuring dyspnea so they may be used selectively but they don't help us much in most of the cases there are a lot of assessment tools are there i'll be touching upon some of them which are commonly used so we have a shuttle walking test in it basically we have two cones which are 10 meters apart and patient walks between one cone to the other at a constant speed and we we have to assess that how much meters he is able to walk with, with having with, without having dyspnea then reading aloud so if patient is very uh, dyspneic so he will not be able to read very fast and you can per perceive that breathlessness when patient is talking so other other skills like vas scale bok scale nrs and mmrc i will be coming to in the next slides coming to the vas scale vas scale is visual visual analog scale is like any other vas scale basically there is a horizontal line which is 100 mm and there are descriptors in the end which say what are the extremes which what they suggest so zero generally means no shortness of breath at all and 100 means maximum shortness of breath so patients have to mark a line so in this say probably is about 20 to 25 uh, that this much will be the perception of dyspnea by the patient in the current state and we do not only at rest but also during activity and we we can see the change that how what is the change in dyspnea on physical activity which patient is able to do in routine routine scenario so this is important and we should always do and a simple test to learn and to tell to the patients then we have modified bok scale the modified bok scale is a 12 point scale and it corresponds to an increasing shortness of breath so we have zero which is means nothing at all 0.5 is very slight one is very slight and goes on till 10 which is maximal we ask the patient to mark the most appropriate see uh, number doing for shortness during rest and during activity so in this we have a slight breathlessness at rest and say about severe to very severe during activity so before starting the exercise we ask the patient to rate the intensity of breathing discomfort and fatigue using this scale and at the end of exercise also we remind the patient that he had this kind of breathlessness before activity and what his is breathlessness after this activity so he rates himself and we then compare the breathlessness with respect to rest and activity then mmrc is basically modified medical research council scale it is more of a investigational tool for research purposes developed in early 50s uh, for managing the pneumoconiosis research and later modified in 1988 it basically qualifies disability attributable to breathlessness and characterizes the baseline dyspnea in these patients so it classifies at 0 to 4 so grade 0 means it is absolutely normal no breathlessness except on strenuous exercise which i am sure most of us get it so it is a normal patient there is no breathlessness at all in the patient and as you move from 0 to 4 the breathlessness severity will increase for one it is shortness of breath when hurrying on the level or walking up the hill and as we go to 4 in, in stage 4 the patient is too breathless to leave the house or breathlessness when dressing or undressing so basically <clears throat> like breathlessness at rest so they are not able to do a slightest of activity the problem with this scale is that it does not capture the patient effort so behavioral responses are not reflected in this scale this scale and most of the scales of breathlessness do not correlate with the spirometric measurements or fev1 so as i earlier told it is the perception of the patient it may not correlate with the lung dynamics which patients might be having and there is a good correlation with health related quality of life especially in patients with copd so it, a lot of studies you will see where in copd patients mmrc is used to quantify the effect of dyspnea then this is oxygen cost diagram when patients are asked to identify the activity they cannot form they cannot perform so we <clears throat> brief walking up the hill 
has maximum oxygen cost attached to it and something like sleeping or slow walking or level ground is a low oxygen cost activity so this means that less the oxygen cost the less is the activity the patient is able to do and more severe the dyspneic patient is so basically 0 to 10 or 20 is a dyspnea at rest so patient has a severe dyspnea so once he assess the dyspnea then we have to plan the management for that then first thing is how, what is the investigations we do do we do investigations in all patients and how do we become wiser by doing the investigations so there are a lo lot of investigations which we can do in patients with dyspnea so starting from uh, hemoglobin level which tells us about the anemia so if the context is like that suppose the patient is bleeding pr patient has a ca colon or rectum and bleeding pr profusely looks pale so uh, if the hemoglobin comes three we expect that there will be anemia and if it is three or four if we give a blood then patient dyspnea might improve so it should be done when we feel that clinically the symptoms are suggestive of that dis disorder then other dis like glucose electrolytes and blood urea they may be metabolic causes of dyspnea thyroid profile because hypohypothyroidism may lead to dyspnea the lung function test like lung volumes, PFT and diffusion lung capacity, pulse oximetry to detect hypoxemia, chest x-ray, ECG and echo <clears throat> if there are cardiac respiratory abnormalities and plasma BNP in case patients with heart failure. So testing might help to identify the cause, but it should be appropriate with the goal of the patient. So we can order all the battery of tests. We may be wiser by diagnosis, but may not be able to help even if we make the diagnosis. So the, the point I'm trying to make is that we should do the testing only and only when we are going to do something for the patient with the testing, especially in context of the palliative care. And the therapeutic goal in breathlessness in the palliative care is to relieve the sense of effort of breathing. And in any case, we cannot cure the disease. So the, all the efforts are to improve the efforts of breathing. So if you have a patient who, who is uh, has a severe dyspnea, has a malignancy, he has see a lung or lung is destroyed so there's no point repeating this test again again this will add to the distress to the patient and we are not contributing to relieve his symptoms so we should be wisely choosing the test and do them only when they are needed uh, coming to the management of dyspnea so as i just said the terminal cause patients the cause is often untreatable so goal is to reduce the distress but in some patients there might be reversible causes and like patient might be having a pneumonia, there might be pleural effusion, so there might be pneumothorax, there might be pulmonary embolism, there might be airway obstruction or SVC syndrome, there might be anemia or CHF. So depending on the clinical context, so there is a strong reason to believe that there is a reversible cause which can definitely improve the symptom. We can plan the therapy accordingly, depending on the patient's preferences and the caregiver's preferences. Coming to the management of dyspnea, so first are the general measures. So general measures are positioning. So we have seen most of us that dyspneic patients tend to have a typical posture which gives them best relief. So there might be passive fixation of shoulder girdle by bracing upper limbs. They might be placing hands on the, the hips and to assist ventilatory efficiency. Patients tend to be having forward leaning, which with diaph domes of diaphragm leading to improved force generation. They may be having adapted forward le leaning for lying and they may be leaning forward while sitting. So any of these postures may help depending on the patient and mostly the patients tend to have the posture which gives them best comfort with minimum respiratory effort. Then there are a lot of breathing techniques which we can teach the patients. We can tell, take the help of physiotherapists or, or we can tell them ourselves. So breathing control <clears throat> can be suggested to encourage the patients to bring back their own breathing to an efficient pattern. So this will help to reduce hyperventilation and encourage them to have appropriate tidal volumes and efficient use of breathing with minimum workload to the muscles. Then they can be pursed lip breathing. We can see we a lot of COPD patients tend to have increased the airway pressure during expiration to maintain the airway potency and improve the expiratory airflow. 
the exhalation on effort it focuses on out breath and facilitates recovery of breathing we can teach the patients to have relaxed slow and deep breathing and they can be paced breathing to maintain the control and reduce dizziness so all these techniques can be taught to the patient to improve their breathing effort and reduce the effort of breathing then <clears throat> firstly breathing you can see so it tends to reduce the dynamic hyperinflation and improves the exchange at the alveolar level we should ensure that this max nutrition is taken maximum by the patient depending on his capacity because many of these patients are not taking enough food and so they are so weak they are unable to breathe properly and oxygen should be given if needed i'll be coming to oxygen in subsequent slides so as i said the most important thing we need to do is decrease the perception of dyspnea so lot of studies have suggested that fan therapy is effective in relieving relieving dyspnea in patient with terminally ill cancer patients what basically it tends to blow the cool air on the face and there are two theories which have been postulated one says that it tends to cool the temperature on the face which tends to reduce the perception of dyspnea or second they say that it stimulates the trigeminal nerve which affects the afferents going into the central nervous system and reduces the perception of dyspnea then there are a lot of distraction strategies which have been suggested like uh, cognitive behavioral therapy and acupuncture and music music we have tried in our setup for some time and it actually works so this will help in reducing the perception of dyspnea then chest wall vibration do does help in stimulation of respiratory afferent nerves and reduces the perception of dyspnea if all these things fail <clears throat> we, we can always go to opioids and i'll be coming to it in the subsequent slides so broadly uh, to manage dyspnea if it is mild we have to treat the underlying cause if possible and manage the psychological factors if it is moderate we need to treat the underlying cause manage psychological factors start pulmonary rehabilitation and may need to give an anxiolytic in severe dyspnea you may have to treat the cause manage the psychology rehabilitate you can use facial cooling opioids anxi anxiolytics and in select cases nip some patients have coexisting copd along with a malignancy or patients of copd primarily with end of disease so you need to optimize the pre existing bronchodilator therapy the long acting muscarinic antagonist or long acting beta agonist or inhaled corticosteroid so depending on the disease severity a combination of drugs can be changed to optimize the bronchodilator therapy and it may help in certain situations patients who are on heart failure that you may have to optimize diuretics to, to start with and it might help to reduce pulmonary edema and heart congestion and improve the dyspnea perception then drugs like glucocorticoids uh, are the magic drugs so in palliative setting most of the settings they, they tend to help especially in patients with copd exacerbations svc syndrome steroid responsive malignancies like lymphoma and thymoma radiation or chemotherapy induced pneumonitis and pulmonary lymphangitis carcinomatosis so this select settings or steroids may help to reduce the disease pathophysiology and may improve the symptom of dyspnea then there is a role of therapeutic rigid bronchoscopy also so in patients with a complete airway obstruction from a tumor the symptom burden can be significantly reduced if a rigid bronchoscopy procedure is done and the tumor is debulking is done followed by airway stenting so we do these procedures uh, quite often in our setup and we have found that we retrospectively studied about 105 patients with co and we found that a timely rigid bronchoscopy debulking of the tumor reduced the dyspnea from 7.5 which was baseline to 2.5 so it was a drastic improvement in dyspnea and it does help the patients but it should be done by experts in tertiary care centers only then we have malignant pleural effusion this is also a common setting in our setup we can see a uh, effusion which is there and patients are dyspneic we can test it bed side we can see on put an ultrasound and we can see an effusion which is present there so if it is a malignant pleural effusion and patient is not symptomatic we, we can only we can observe the patient nothing needs to be done but if it is symptomatic 
we can aspirate. We do it at our setup ourselves. But if you're not used to tapping the uh, pleural cavity, you can always refer to a respiratory physician. So we can aspirate up to 500 to 1.5 liters to relieve the symptoms. And then if the prognosis is less than a month, then you have to see whether there is a lung trapping in the in the in the fluid. If there is no lung trapping, then a pleurodesis can be planned. So the, what does pleurodesis do? Pleurodesis basically obliterates the cavity in the pleura between the visceral and the parietal pleura, and so that the space is not there. So the space is obliterated. So further fluid accumulation in case of malignant pleural effusion will not occur. So we can use talc, we can use iodine, we can use bleomycin. Yeah, there are various drugs which can be used. At our setup, we are using bleomycin. And this is an effective strategy and it de definitely improves. And we can see this is one of our patients. So we had a massive pleural effusion. Patient was dyspneic at rest. We tapped, we did a single tap and there's a lung cell expander. So we, we can always do that and in select settings and it drastically improves symptoms and patients are very happy and the dyspnea scale is reduced. Then opioids are another wonder drugs after glucocorticoids in palliative settings. So low dose opioids do have a role for reducing dyspnea in palliative care settings. So there is a multimodal mechanism of action. So opioids, we know they decrease the ventilatory rate. They, they decrease, they cause slow and shallow breathing. So it tends to reduce the effort of respiration. They decrease the metabolic rate. They tend to reduce the medullary sensitivity to hypercarbia and hypoxia. They suppress the respiratory awareness. Patient generally are in pain, especially in end of life. They leads to or sympathetic stimulation and stimulates the respiratory drive. So analgesia due to opioids may reduce that cycle and improve the pain as well as dyspnea perception. They have anti-anxiolytics. Then they may blunt the transmission of mechanoreceptors from the lungs to the CNS. And in the heart, they cause vasodilatation. They improve the cardiac function. They tend to reduce pulmonary edema and they're effective in heart failure patients, MI patients, and COPD patients as well, in addition to malignancy patients. So they can be used selectively, and but the dosing have to be appropriate. So the lot of routes which are there, we can use orally, IV, subcutaneous, transdermal, nebulized, transmucosal, there are a lot of routes which are available. And But the dose has to be appropriate. So morphine is most commonly used in our setup. So orally, we can use five to 10 milligram in divided doses every three to four hours. And IV, we generally use 1.5 to 3 milligram in repeated doses. This is for a patient who is not on opioids. So say if somebody is already on opioid and patient is having pain, he's taking, say, morphine 10 milligram 4 hourly or 20 milligram 4 hourly. So we need to give additional morphine to take care of dyspnea. So you can increase by about 20 to 25% and give in divided doses. And this will help definitely to reduce the symptom of dyspnea. So... If we give opioids, uh, we have to take care of possible constipation and nausea, which may occur due to it. We have to re reassess the patients very frequently. And if the patient has a dyspnea which is worsening, despite uh, giving opioids, then probably there's some infective pathology. So you need to rule it out and you give antibiotics to take care of it. There are a lot of novel approaches are coming up for opioids. So we have a fentanyl buccal tablets, which have been used for episodic exertional dyspnea. Uh, then we have nasal sprays of fentanyl, which have been shown to be effective in exercise induced dyspnea in cancer patients. So this study, they concluded that uh, nasal spray of fentanyl was safe, reduced dyspnea at rest and increased walk distance in patients who received it after having it. Then uh, the, it, it was also shown to be effective to reduce respiratory distress in children and adolescents with life-limiting conditions. So we, we have other routes to give, especially if the patients are not able to take it. But the problem is the cost is very more than what average person can bear it. So morphine, say, is about 28 rupees, but oral transmucosal citrate is in 5,000 something and buccal tablets are 3,000 something 
and in addition they are not available in our setup mostly so they are not the first line treatment for us but yes in select patients if they can afford and if we subsequently have it in our setup we can always use them a word about uh, nebulized op opioids so there are a lot of studies which uh, say that nebulized route of opioid delivery may limit the systemic absorption and reduce the side effects related to opioid if we give systemically so but the data is very very limited to recommend its use through a nebulized route the main action is on the central pathways and nebulized route may not be sufficient to attain adequate levels of opioid for its action so as of now the systemic route is the preferred route for dyspnea and we generally do not use it in our setup and we do not also recommend a nebulized route to for dyspnea management for opioids now the important question is we are talking of opioids and patient is dyspneic patient is terminally ill and what happens if we give opioid does the patient have higher respiratory depression or does it hasten the death of the patient so whether we should be worried are we safe in the court of law so there are a lot of questions which come when we give opioids so what is respiratory depression so respiratory depression is something like a rise in intraoral co partial pressure of co2 and a fall in oxygen saturation as well as a reduction in rate of respiration so we have a reduced respiratory rate increase in co2 and decrease in oxygen content it is always preceded by sedation and the process of sedation through to reduction and cessation of breathing takes about 5 to 15 minutes so once the patient is sedated patient might have inefficient respiration might have respiratory depression but there are a lot of studies which show that opioids do calm the respiration but they do not cause respiratory depression and the studies to studying based relationship between opioid dose the change of dose and use of sedatives and time to death actually have not shown that in patient with advanced illness there is any effect of opioids on hastening death or causing respiratory depression so we are relatively safe but we have to definitely monitor the patient and the effect of iv comes in about 10 to 15 minutes and oral dose comes in about 30 minutes so we have to monitor the patients and ask them to be in constant touch and we should be we, we should be feeling safe while giving opioids in low doses for breathlessness coming to the role of oxygen so oxygen therapy is <clears throat> generally considered in patient who are hypoxemic at room air so acp says that short term relief might be there of hypoxemia with patients in if we give oxygen patients with terminal illness the advantage is of oxygen are that it reduces hypoxemia reduces lactic acid decreases pulmonary ar arterial pressure reduces the ventilatory muscle and diaphragmatic fatigue it may relieve bronchoconstriction it may stimulate the facial nasal and pharyngeal receptors so many people say that when you give oxygen or if you give a fan blowing on the face both the things they reduce the stimulation of the facial receptors and then tend to reduce the perception of dyspnea the effect is more or less similar then patient might have increased capacity to exercise and some say it is a placebo effect so there are a lot of benefits which are there oxygen but the problem is that there is a cost attached to it especially if you give a domiciliary oxygen to the home by bulk equipment might be bulky you you have an oxygen concentrator cylinder or something so there is a setup to it and there is a bulkiness to it and patient have a restricted mobility so if something somebody is on oxygen so mobility is very restricted for two systematic reviews have shown that there is no consistent benefit of oxygen over in air inhalation for dyspnea and terminal illness so the effects are plus minus so you may consider in select settings but they generally do not help always so if we give oxygen the goal is to give maintain a saturation between 90 to 92 so we do not aim at 100 we maintain at 90 to 92 so it it may increase survival in patient with a copd or a heart failure but does not prevent hospitalization or death among patients with moderate to severe hypoxemia and there's no role of oxygen in non hypoxemic patients so only hypoxic patients oxygen might help so coming to role of niv so after oxygen many of times we are faced with the dilemma that whether we should go for niv for the patients patients are very pushy they want some kind of ventilatory support so before we discuss nav so 
what is NIV for the postgraduate? So NIV is something like a positive pressure ventilation, which is delivered through a non-invasive interface. So basically we may use a mask, which may be nasal or facial or a nasal prop. So anything which is given externally without intubation or tricostomy is a non-invasive ventilation. The use is in palliative settings is controversial. The passive benefits are it may reduce work of breathing, it may ease dyspnea and may reduce the need of opioids. So patients are less sedated, they're more wakeful. An indication is a severe dyspnea in patients who do not want invasive ventilation and prefer a comfort care. And the short term goal, like say, if we have a patient admitted high profile, the relatives are in uh, outside India, maybe US or UK, they want their relatives to come back. So to temporarily prolong life for short term goals for so that the near relatives can come and meet them. So we can always start with NIV rather than an invasive ventilation for, for the short term goal of the patient. But there are a lot of problems of NIV. <clears throat> so they may prolong the dying process. So as, as I show you, there's a big mask on the face. So a lot of claustrophobia, patient may not tolerate it well. There's a cost attached and may not be easy to manage at home. So you need a good nursing support. You need a clinical support. You need the BiPAP CPAP machine. <clears throat> so there's a cost to it. You may, may need to sedate the patients for better tolerability, but it may be a tricky thing to do, especially in patients who are borderline mental status. And it is often noisy and may frighten the patient as well as caregivers. So it, it tends to add to the anxiety of the patients and the caregivers in the palliative setting. So coming to the anxiety, so dyspnea leads to panic, fear of impending death, it leads to, which adds to breathlessness, which further adds to fear of dying and it leads to death. So there's a big vicious cycle and we need to break them sometimes. Benzodiazepines may be used as an adjunctive therapy, but role of benzodiazepine alone is not very clear and we are not using benzodiazepine alone in patients with dyspnea. But yes, in select patients, along with other strategies and opioids, we may use a low dose benzodiazepines to relieve the perception. A word about palliative sedation. So, in patients of end of life, refractive symptoms may cause severe distress. So, palliative sedation refers to use of drugs such as opioids or benzodiazepines to reduce the awareness of refractive symptom by decreasing the level of consciousness. So we have to be very sure that all treatment options have been taken care of. We have given due diligence and we use all of them. And despite that, if we do not able to control the symptom, then we label it as a refractive symptom and our palliative sedation can be tried. And we can use a morphine or a midazolam depending on the setting. I'll not be discussing the details of palliative sedation because it is a, a complete class and probably it will be scheduled sometime later. So broadly, uh, if a patient comes with a mild dyspnea, we need to optimize bronchodilators, which may be a short or long acting, may need to give oxygen therapy. If it is persistent or increasing, or non-pharmacological measures like first lip breathing, fan, relaxation, etc., can be tried. And despite that, if it is persistent, we might lead to use of pharmacological measures like opioids or anxiolytics. So it is something like a WHO ladder. You can uh, do a step-down approach a step up approach or a step down depending on the setting so in in a palliative setting end of life you may start with this and opioids first and gradually go down if patient is improving or if in early stage mild dyspnea you may start with the early stage and gradually go down to opioids and anxieties so it purely depends on the clinical context and the setting we are working on so the next question is who does who takes care of breathlessness? So we have a medicine person, we have a cardiologist, we have a pulmonary physician, we have palliative care physician, or so it is the job of a palliative care physician or somebody else's job. So the problem is that breathlessness do, does occur commonly in COPD heart failure, often neglected, and patients have a terrible end of life. They have a very poor quality of life. So to answer this, we have a specialized breathlessness services there. So rather than making the patient football and sending him here and there. Specialist clinics have been established in some setups. So breathlessness intervention service is a multidisciplinary complex intervention, which combines the non-pharmacological and pharmacological intervention, which we have discussed, to the support breathlessness of patients in advantages. So the only aim is to control breathlessness. 
So generally it is flexible intervention and responsive to the need of the patient. So it depends on the need, the patient can have the set core of components and we can customize as per the need of the patient and consultation occur at home of the patient. So this is the best part. So patient is cared at home because as we know, the patients are dyspneic, not easy for them to move and but it is best to give the care at the, their home. So it is more clinically effective and cost effective, reduces repeated admissions, repeated hospital and visits of the patient and improves the breathlessness care of the patient. So it consists of a basic uh, breathlessness uh, intervention team, a uh, multi-specialty team, combination of physiotherapists, psychotherapists, occupational therapists, and uh, physicians, a medical assessment team, then the appointment occurs at home of the patient, as earlier said, range to have a lot of visits. They might be telephonically visit of, or visit in person. Then uh, we have length of uh, services about two weeks. So they tend to optimize the breathlessness in two weeks. And they've shown that it tends to improve the breathlessness, especially in patients who are given it early. So we can think we actually don't have it in our, uh, probably in, in our setup and also in India, but this is something which can be work. We can work on it and we can introduce in our setup and tend to improve the perception of breathlessness of the patient. So coming to the end, few end slides. So if you have a patient with breathlessness, uh, then we have to take a thorough history assessment and broadly classify as a malignant etiology or a non-malignant etiology. If a malignant etiology is there, we see whether we can do a curative chemo radiotherapy or a palliative radio chemotherapy. Uh, if it is not possible, we see if there's any procedural management which needs to be done, any tumor debulking or a palliative surgery, some endoscopic stenting, some intervention radiological procedures which can be done, or if there can be a tapping which may be there in the pleura or in the ascites or in the pericardium, which can be done, which may reduce the perception of dyspnea. If it is a non-malignant etiology, we can see whether this kind of procedural management is there or we need to optimize the medical management of COPD and chest and uh, heart failure. Once it is done and patient is still dyspneic, we have to further classify as episodic or chronic dyspnea. If it is episodic dyspnea, we can give short-acting opioids, SOS or as and when needed. We can give inhaled drugs, though not found to be very effective, and some non-pharmacological like relaxation therapy can be suggested. If there's a chronic dyspnea, we can give long-acting opioids and a non-pharmacological therapy, we can be initiated. If the patient is still dyspneic and is anxious or depressed, we need to give anxiolytic, we have to give an antidepressant, and we can do one, SSRIs can also be added, and if possible, uh, if something nothing is working, we can work for go towards a palliative sedation if it aligns with the goals of the care of the patient, and um, we can consider that. If there is a terminal pneumonia which might be there and there are a lot of secretions, it, it is also a challenge uh, in a dying patient. So we may need to give reduce the fluid intake of the patient and give drugs to reduce the secretions, which might be uh, atropine, scopolamine, and glycoparlate, depending on the availability and the tolerability of the patient. So this is the broad management plan for dyspnea in a palliative setting. So to conclude, dyspnea is a subjective experience of breathing discomfort or breathlessness that will affect patients in advanced disease. A palliative care physician, we need to assess the intensity of dyspnea, the distress associated, the functional impact, try to find the reversible causes and monitor the response to intervention, whatever we do. A lot of general measures like relaxation techniques, psychosocial support, activity level modification have been suggested. Uh, a fan, cooling, all of them, they have some benefit and should be used if possible. We need to optimize the basic therapy, including bronchodilators, glucocorticoids, and diuretics to relieve dyspnea. For hypoxemic patients with SpO2 less than 88%, a therapeutic trial of oxygen should be given. So despite all these measures, if dyspnea is persisting, systemic opioids are the drug of choice and should be used in, in close monitoring and titrated doses. For a lot of anxiety, in select cases, benzodiazepines may be used as an injective therapy. NRA use is controversial in dyspneic patient and decision needs to be individualized depending on the patient care goals and the setup. 
we have a lot of breathlessness management clinics which are coming up and we, which we can think for future and they provide comprehensive management of dyspnea. And in case everything fails, we need to opt for palliative sedation to relieve distress of the patient. So this was my last slide. Thank you. For any questions, you can mail me or you can send me the questions. Uh, thank you so much, sir. It was indeed an ac excellent presentation. Uh, we do have questions in chat. So uh, if we can go through it. First question is about positioning in uh, uh, SVCO. So in SVCO patients, that is superior vena cava obstruction patients, uh, is there a role of positioning? See, for SVCO, the it will all depend uh, the compression of the great of uh, the trachea at what level the compression is there. So for positioning, the best thing is that patient tends to have the position which is best suited to him. So generally, uh, semi-sitting 45 degree position, slightly leaning forward, the dyspnea tends to improve even in SVCO syndrome. So, uh, thank you, sir. Uh, sir, uh, we have a couple of questions on uh, fan or cool air, which mm -hmm. is uh, blown on face. So, uh, I think people want to know more about uh, how does it work. Okay, so uh, actually the, there are two theories I have uh, suggested in my talk that uh, may help, uh, especially with the fans. So, what they suggest is that when your cool air blows on the face, this tends to reduce the temperature of the face per se. So the perception goes to the brain. So the cooling tends to reduce the perception of breathlessness. So that it reduces the of efferents that go from the brain to the ventilatory center, then to the periphery of lungs and the chest wall. And it, it reduces the, breath, reduces the uh, activity of ventilatory muscles and reduces the breathlessness. And second uh, role they've suggested is that it stimulates the trigeminal nerve. This trigeminal nerve against the, goes, uh, sends the signals to the cortex, cortex, the motor and the sensory, and which tends to reduce the efferents going to the lungs to stimulate respiration. So essentially, the sensations, afferent sensations going to the brain goes that reduces the sensation, that reduces the efferents which are going and reduces the ventilatory mechanics and reduces the perception. Yes, uh, sir. Uh, there is a, a question on the paper that you had shown about bronchoscopic debulking. Mm -hmm. so if you can explain more about bronchoscopic debulking. Okay. So actually, there are a lot of patients who have a large tumor uh, which is sitting inside the trachea or the bronchus, which cannot be surgically resected because of the location of the tumors. So what they do is they do pulmonologists do a rigid bronchoscopy under anesthesia, and uh, because of the tumor, there is a critical stenosis in the respiratory tract. So breathing is labored. So patient has a lot of dyspnea because of the tumor. So we, we, we can think of our large tube, which, is, which has a blockage. Uh, so what we have to do is we have to remove this blockage. So pulmonary medicine people, they tend to do a rigid bronchoscopy. So since we have an anesthetist and a uh, palliative physicians also, so we, we, tend, we give anesthesia for these patients and under anesthesia, they remove the tumor, whatever is feasible for them under rigid bronchoscopy. So once the tumor is removed, the says the stenosis was 80%. So only 20% passage was there before the procedure. So once the procedure is done, say they are able to remove 40 to 50% of tumor, the stenosis is reduced and the patency improves to 60 to 70% from 20%. So the passage is widened. So once the passage is widened, the airflow becomes more laminar and perception of dyspnea will reduce. So this is actually very effective in patients, in select patients who have a central airway obstruction because of the tracheal or a bronchial tumor. Yeah. And uh, also they want to know uh, how are patients selected for this? Uh, so do we do a CT or how they are selected on base? Yeah. Yes, they do. Yeah, do. Since it is a therapeutic intervention, basically, most sometimes it is therapeutic and a lot of times it is palliative, depending on how much tumor they are able to remove. So they do a full scan, they do a CT scan, they, may, they also do a uh, flexible bronchoscopy without anesthesia to know the exact location of the tumor. 
what is the size and whether it is amenable to dissection uh, through a rigid bronchoscopy or not. So not all tumors can be uh, taken care of by this, but yes, see, in, we have been doing this for about six, seven years. So we have about 100, 120 of central area obstructions which have been operated. So in select patients, if this amenable to procedure, they are only taken up. So uh, Nishkash, can you explain about the stenting also here that uh, you yes. do, we do stenting for the airway obstruction? That is yes. also, I think, we can uh, cover. Thanks for reminding me. So once the passage is patent to some extent, metallic stents or uh, special stents which are made up of uh, specialized material can be put. They, we have a take a straight stent. We have a Y stent depending on the need of the patient. So if the tumor is in the bronchus, we need a Y stent. If the tumor is in the trache primary trachea, then we need a straight stent. So the stenting tends to further make the space patent and keep it patent. So it is like a splint. So if you put a splint, so because we have a tumor, so the cartilage also tend to erode. So they have become uh, less compliant. So once you remove the tumor, they tend to fall back on itself and the space may again be blocked. So by putting in a stent, you tend to splint that space and the space retains the patency even after the procedure is done. So they do a lot of stenting is there and it helps in maintaining the space for respiration and improving the dyspnea sensation subsequently. And the quality of life actually improves drastically. So we have seen that these patients who could not breathe, they, are, they can do most of the activities which, are, which, which they need to do for their daily activities. So it actually improves the quality drastically. Hello, can I add a question here? Yes, please. Yeah, so uh, my question was further on to the same bronchoscopic procedure where uh, you debulk the tumor. It sounds like very, very uh, in thing and the need of the R. But my questions are two. One is, do you do, do it as a preventive measure? As in, when a patient comes with dyspnea, uh, it's quite, quite often difficult for us to take them for any procedure or even for a, any invasive procedure because of the, the dyspnea. So do you do this procedure as, an, as a preventive measure? One. And what is the selection criteria for example, what type of patients based on the performance status would you select for this uh, procedure? Uh, see, uh, there are two things to it. Firstly, uh, this is a multidisciplinary procedure. So uh, as anesthetists and palliative physicians, we are not doing it, but we are assisting in doing it. So we, as anesthetists, we give, which give, we give anesthesia to get it done as, as, um, Palliative care physician, we, we facilitate some patients who come to us with a, with a kind of malignancy in this setting. So the selection is very important. You are very right. See, the patient, this has to be done under anesthesia. It cannot be done without anesthesia. Rigid bronchoscopy, you need anesthesia for the patient. And sometimes it is very tricky because it is a central air, airway obstruction. And anything you give, patient might collapse and you may not be able to manage it. So you need to take a calculated risk in, in consultation with a pulmonary physician that whether it is safe giving anesthesia to this patient and whether doing an intervention will benefit the patient subsequently. So as I said, we need to assess the patient. So patient has generally has a malignancy. We, we already have a lot of papers of the patient, a lot of reports that patient there's a malignancy, there's a tumor, intratracheal or bronchial, surgically not amenable. Then they do a fibro-optic bronchoscopy uh, without anesthesia to find out what is the level of tumor and whether it is surgically or whether it is uh, at multiple levels and once they are very remove the tumor and it is going to benefit then only it is a risk is being taken. Uh, can I add the answer to this? Yes ma'am. Uh, yes yes. yes uh, ma'am. So, uh, so Srikant, uh, the, uh, the problem is that uh, all these patients will not be fitting to the what the stenting and the debulking procedure. But uh, if general condition is good, because we are coordinating and collaborating with pulmonary medicine department closely, that's why we are doing this regularly. So if uh, general condition is good, if you think that this mass is a big mass and by debulking or by putting stents, we can provide quality of life for some time because the, Nishkarsh is not saying that we are going to remove this bulk and he's going to survive for a long time. But whatever time, one month, two months, three months, we have seen that most of the patients after this, 
they are not going to survive for long but even if 2 3 months they are going to survive better by putting stents so it will all depend on the general condition of a patient it will all depend on the performance scale of the patient before and uh, it is in close coordination with pulmonary physician so because we are working since last 15 years with pulmonary physician closely that's why we have an experience that it works to improve quality of life because we are not going to do anything to cure but to improve quality of life this is a in selected group of patients it is a technique which we can use Uh, yes, and you are absolutely right. And uh, important thing I want to highlight is that, as Ma'am has also said, that it cannot be done by anybody and everybody. So you have to be very expert in a tertiary care center, which you are doing the procedure day in day out. And secondly, in CEO patients, you opioids you cannot give because uh, it is it it can lead to a, a sudden death of the patient because the the area of the trachea is already narrow. So those patients the in select patients uh, it actually does a benefit to the patient even though he may may not survive long depending on the disease trajectory but yes you give a good quality of life so uh, thank you for discussing that uh, in details uh, so we have a question on what anxiolytics uh, would you prefer in patients with refractory dyspnea see uh, um, we generally use midazolam uh, but not to uh, in low doses in in as an adjunct to opioid therapy so we don't use primary benzodiazepines as they are not found to be very effective alone in reducing the perception of dyspnea and we use low doses intermittently say if we are giving iv 0.5 mg 4.25 depending on the disease condition of the patient because uh, benzodiazepines can be really tricky especially in patients who have copd or bronchial asthma in addition uh, it they can uh, it can really uh, block their respiratory drive and can lead to a problem so we generally do not recommend a routine use but yes uh, select cases in low doses i think they want to know about the names uh, Med- midazolam midazolam is is short acting drug so we are using that if required and iv route i will do it and if you have to give oral then anxio uh, alprazolam 0.25 mg can be tried thank you sir um so there's one last question on uh, dexmedetomidine uh, mm-hmm. and midazolam so which one would you prefer for sedation and wards uh, for as anesthetists i have used dexmed much but for palliative setting i have not much experience using dexmedetomidine for sedation uh as it is not recommended also but maybe we can use it Ma- ma'am you want to add on dexmed because i i have not used it personally for sedation in palliative settings yeah dexmedetomidine can be used in terminal sedation uh when you think that uh, we are almost uh, it's a matter of few hours to give uh, to give comfort to the patient as well as to the relatives and yourself also when patient is dyspneic and uh, you are uh you see that patient is this neck relatives are uncomfortable they are restless that time i think it is in the scenario of terminal sedation it is a good drug of choice otherwise giving midazolam or alprazolam short acting anxiolytic with morphine i think works very well and trying to find out the cause always it is not that if patient is terminal we can leave patient with just a uh medication there are always some cause so we should first try to rule out the cause if it is infection try to rule out if it is obstruction and you have a good pulmonary medicine setup and general condition is good take a consultation so that you know ultimately in palliative care quality of life is most important so quality of life at any cost we have to provide in spite of knowing that uh life expectancy is very very less or in terms of some weeks or months or something like this uh so uh this is what i wanted to say that uh um miss we should do every we should give all efforts to give comfort to the patient as much as possible i think uh, there is a comment on this by dr preeti she says bradycardias are more with dexmet see when you are taking yeah. 
<laughs> so all yeah, drugs, whatever not... we use, will have some symptom. No, that will that is always there. Yeah, Doctor Preeti, this will be there. Bradycardia is more. I am just saying that in terminal sedation, when patient we are imminent, imminently dying, and we think that is matter of few hours, or nothing is working. Your anxieties are not working. Bronchodilators are not working. Morphine is not working. Then I think uh, it is better to sedate the patient so that uh, you are you. Think that patient is comfortable, relatives are comfortable, the whole surroundings are comfortable. So <clears throat> there are side effects of every drug, and it's same with this drug also. Yeah, uh, I think we have overshot the time, so uh, we would stop here. But there are certain questions on use of phenobarb and uh, steroids, which may be covered in our uh, chat group. Uh, so, uh, uh, or maybe I can send an email so so uh, so can respond to these questions. Thank you so much for Thank you, Thank you, you ma'am. Thank you. Thank you, Anuja. Thank, Thank you, Nisha. Thank you, Nishkash.